I'm gonna, I'll have to unplug it. I couldn't find a, a switch back there. I tried. Hello, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, we'll start in around two minutes. Eva, you ask for me, Sean. Let's start your chair. One more minute. We're just waiting for people to come in. Okay, so we're going to start. So good morning, everyone. So I hope you can see my slides and then you can hear me properly. Okay, I'll start sharing my slides. Okay, can you see it? Everything's clear?
Okay, so everyone can see it. Thumbs up. So thank you to everyone who's joining us. So I hear that most of you are from the Philippines and then there are other people from other countries. So thank you for taking time to join us in this forum. So we're going to be talking about a very important and um, important case. And then uh, um, we're going to be talking about burn surgeries, no? burn emergencies. I mean. So I'm Dr. Roberto Shoko. I'm a plastic surgery fellow here in St. Luke's. So we have this forum, lay forum that we do monthly. And then so there are different topics. So we're, you're all invited to join the forum. So we're going to be posting it in the YouTube and in our Facebook and account and in the website. So some of you may, might be wondering why a plastic surgeon is uh, going to be talking about burn. So just to inform you, plastic surgery isn't just about aesthetic or, or beautification procedures. So we also deal with them reconstructive um, cases and emergency cases such as trauma and burn. Yeah. So today I'll be, talk to, I'll be talking to you about um, burn emergencies and uh, <clears throat> what you need to know and then simple home tips that you can use in your um, whenever you encounter such cases. So for the burn statistics here in the Philippines, according to the DOH last year, um, for 2020, we had 1,674 burn injuries recorded. So most of these Hold on, I'll just pick something. Hello? Yeah. So I got muted, so can you hear me? Okay, so going back. There, so going back. So last year we had 1,674 burn injuries recorded. <clears throat> so most of the patients were male, and then most of the injuries occurred at home. So according to the statistics, the most common cause of injury were the skull burns. So I'm going to be talking about later the different types of burns. Then we also have the electrical burns coming second and then fire burns. <clears throat> also in their data, the most common injured uh, patients were children aged one to four years old. And most of the time, the burn injuries occurred in the morning around 8 in the morning to 12 p.m., and then 4 p.m. to 8 in the evening. So in the Philippines, we have five burn centers um, which are accredited. So these are the Philippine General Hospital, the Jose Reyes Medical Memorial Medical Center, the East Avenue Medical Center, the Carino Memorial Medical Center, and then the Southern Philippines Medical Center in Davao. So I'm affiliated also with the Jose Reyes and then the Carino Memorial Medical Center. So these uh, these centers have uh, dedicated burn units and dedicated trained staff, such as nurses and doctors, who know how to manage burn injuries. Mm. So we have different types of So we have different types of burns. So firstly, we have the scalp burn. This is the most common type. It's when you accidentally spill um, either hot liquids such as coffee soup or hot water and grease and oil to yourself or to another person. So this is the most common type. Next is a uh, flame burn, which is the second most common type. Um, this is the most common cause of admissions in hospitals. Next is the flash burn. Um, this is caused by explosions from flammable gas or liquid and intense flash of light or strong thermal radiation. 
So here in the Philippines, mostly it's caused by gas tanks when cooking, such as those LPGs that um, are malfunctioning and then accidentally explode. So they, these are usually associated with flame burns. Next are contact burns. So as the name implies, it's when your skin accidentally touch a, a hot object, such as a hot thermos or the motor of your motorcycle. And then <clears throat> there, so it's a contact burn with direct injury to your skin. Next is an electrical burn. It's when you accidentally touch a live wire. So you have the low voltage if it's less than 1,000 volts or high voltage if it's more than 1,000 volts. So these types of injuries are very dangerous because they can cause systemic injuries. So later on, I'll be talking about um, what type of uh, injuries that can occur when you have an electrical burn and what makes them so dangerous. Also, you have chemical burns. It's when you have when you come in contact uh, with hazardous and toxic chemicals. So these often occur in factories or laboratories when when there is no adequate PPE or, or protective equipment for the workers. <clears throat> so um, when a patient when a burn patient comes to the emergency room, so first and foremost you have to make sure that the patient is stable first. You have to make sure the ABCs of trauma such as airway, breathing, and circulation is properly addressed. And once the patient is stabilized, then you can evaluate the burn wound. So what we use is the total body surface area to compute. This is important for computing the fluid resuscitation needed by the patient. So there, there are different uh, ways to estimate this, but the easiest one is the rule of nines as shown in the picture. So this, um, this, this strategy, it allocates a different percentage per different body part. <clears throat> for example, the head, of an adult is around 9%. And then for an, a child, it's around 18%. <clears throat> and for example, an arm is around 9%. And then the palm of your hand sometimes is being used to assess, um, the to estimate the amount of burn. So it's around 1%. So you can use that as basis for the amount of um, burn injuries. So next is the depth of burn injury. So before we go to that, we have to know the anatomy of the skin first. <clears throat> this is very important because this will dictate whether you will do a surgical or non-surgical treatment because there are burns that can be treated conservatively, but there are um, grave burns that you have to really do surgical treatment on. So this is the skin on the picture and this has, uh, your skin has different layers. The mo top most is the epidermis. It's more comprised mostly of um, skin cells. And the next is the dermis. It's a, uh, this is where you will find the hair follicles, the sebaceous glands, the sweat pores, the nerves, and the, the blood vessels. So this is a very, this uh, layer is very important to determine the depth and the classification of the burn. And underneath it, the dermis is the hypodermis or the subcutaneous tissue where uh, mostly it's fat. And then underneath is the muscle. So first, so we have the most common layperson uh, knows this as first degree, but in, in, in our in medical terms, we use the superficial burns as a description. So the most common type of first degree burn is a sunburn. So these are painful and erythematous. Erythematous meaning it's reddish in, in appearance. But the good thing with this is that it heals within a week. So you don't need to do any aggressive management. You just do conservative treatment. So you can put uh, occlusive dressing such as petroleum gauze and then treat it uh, with pain meds, pain medications. So one thing about skin, if you want it to heal faster, it should be in a moist and clean environment. That's why you have to wash it. Later on, I'll be discussing how to treat it uh, at home. So that's your first degree burn. Next, you have the second degree burns. The, this is um, classified into two types. You have the superficial and the deep. So first, the su superficial type. Um, as you can see in the picture, these burns are usually pink and moist. They're painful because the nerve endings are exposed. So when you touch them, it's very painful. And, and a main characteristic of this type of burn is that it's blistering, meaning it's moist and then it has a, a skin over it, which is called a blister. And then... <clears throat> These types of burns, they usually heal within two weeks with proper management. 
but still, the only treatment that needed needed for these type of burns is conservative treatment, such as greasy gauze and antibiotic ointment. So it's advised to sometimes apply antibiotic, antibiotic ointment because some burns can progress to infection. So you don't want an infected skin. Just remember, remember the skin is your barrier to from infection from the external environment. So practical first aid tips. So once you once you accidentally, for example, a scalp burn, you accidentally pour hot soup on yourself. You place that injured area and apply cool and running water for five to 10 minutes straight. Do not use frozen or ice water because it will injure the skin more. And then afterwards, you can clean it with any soap and water to sterilize it. And then you can put a, a clean um, occlusive dressing. If you don't have any sterile gauze, you can uh, put a clean towel that's washed over it. And then you bring it to the nearest hospital. So what's important is, is that it's evaluated by a doctor. Next is a deep partial thickness burn. It's still a second degree burn, but it's a, it's a more, it's a more aggressive type of burn. So it appears as mottled patchy pink and white as seen in the picture on the left. So they can be painful or painless because the burn is too deep. Sometimes the nerve endings are already devitalized or non-functioning because they're destroyed by the, by the burn. So for these types of patients, you have to immediately bring them to the nearest hospital for treatment. So these types of burns, they can heal, but often they have scarring and possible contractures. So what are skin contractures? So contractures are a thickened scar that limits mobility of that area. For example, in this picture on the left, you can see that there's a thick scar around the mouth of the patient, which uh, prohibits him from opening fully the mouth, hence affecting his um, eating um, capability. Also in the lower picture, you can see that the scars are thick there are a lot of scar contractures that limit mobility of the arm and the hands. So for these types of burns, surgery is recommended if the wound won't heal within three weeks time. But, you don't, uh, but for trained doctors, we don't wait for three weeks. It's, uh, it's our decision. If we think that the, the wound won't heal, then it's better to do an early surgical intervention on the patient to prevent such contractures. So next is a third degree burn or full thickness burns. So these are common in flame burns and electrical burns. So as you can see in the picture, the wounds are light brown to black in color. So they're leathery and then firm to touch. And most of the time they're painless as mentioned because the nerves are already damaged and non-functioning. So definitely for these types of burns, you have to do surgical treatment because those are dead skin. And then you have to take it out because of all the uh, possible infections that might occur after. And then you have to replace those uh, devitalized skin with new skin. So this is what I'm talking about, a skin grafting. This is what we do to treat um, severe burns where uh, we have to take out the dead skin and then replace it with new, with new skin. So this is my patient. So in the picture above, that's what I use, a dermatome to harvest the skin. So you get skin from an uninjured site and then you have to take out the dead skin and make sure the bed, the wound bed is prepared in order to be able to accept that skin graft. Because sometimes you have to also take care of the skin graft afterwards. So it's not like when you put it, it's going to take immediately. You have to also take care of the skin graft afterwards. So it's a very complicated procedure. This is also something that we have to talk about, smoke inhalation. So it causes more than 50% of fire-related deaths. So these often occur in patients that are stuck in, for example, um, in a house fire or in a building where they can't get out. So accidentally they inhale hot smoke. So these require aggressive airway intervention because as you can see in the picture, swelling immediately follows. And then edema, edema in the pharyngeal airway pharyngeal area and then the air, airway, airway can cause obstruction to the breathing of the patient. That's why early endotracheal intubation as seen in the picture is important to safeguard the airway. Next, as I mentioned, uh, we're gonna be talking about electrical burns. 
it's very um, electrical burns are very dangerous because they can have severe tissue destruction, as seen on the picture on the left. You can see that the left hand is already um, with has exposed bone, exposed tendons, and then it's already it actually actually looks dead already. So electric injuries actually most common most of the time injure extremities. But sometimes electrical burns don't have external manifestations. Sometimes the injuries happen inside internally. For example, electrical currents can affect the heart rhythm, which can co cause cardiac death or cardiac arrest. They can also cause internal damage to the kidneys and muscles. That's why for patients that have electrical burns, whether, it, whether they may look um, benign, meaning they don't have external injuries, they should still be brought to the hospital to be evaluated by the doctor. So for my last slide, so we have chemical injuries also. So it's an either acidic or alkali chemicals. So these chemicals actually dissolve the tissue and then burn, bury deep inside the tissue. Actually, actually um, alkali chemicals are more dangerous than acid chemicals because they can continuously bury deep inside the tissue. They have more injury, they cause more injury than alkali chemicals. So first aid for this is you have to remove the inciting agent, such as the contaminated clothes and shoes. And then you copiously irrigate with water the area, especially the eyes. So in the picture below, you can see that there are some hospitals and factories that provide these types of contraptions so that you can wash the, the acid immediately. But if the, the, if the chemical is in powder form, it's ideal that you dust it off first before irrigating because it can activate, the water can activate the, <clears throat> the chemical, which can worsen the burn. And definitely you have to rush to the nearest hospital. For example, for the eyes, they have to be seen by an uh, ophthalmologist to make sure that there's no injury, um, severe injury that, can, that should be addressed. And that's it for the comprehensive uh, topic about burns. Thank you for your kind attention. So I'll be taking some questions now for anyone who, who's interested or want to know more. Okay, so let's check the chat box. So what question do we have here? So I see a question about toothpaste. So toothpaste isn't advice to apply on the wound because you don't know the you don't know the components of the toothpaste. Wait first, I just unmute my moderator so that we can facilitate this better. Thank you, Dr. Shoko, for the discussion. Uh, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, can you answer them uh, short, uh, with short answers? Our first okay. question is, uh, do we use moist or dry, clean towel in occluding the second degree burns? Or uh, is dry towel OK? So if, if you're, for example, an immediate injury, what you do is you apply a moist towel, clean moist towel, so it can cool down that area, but do not apply ice on it. So it, uh, the moisture can help cool the area down. Okay. Second question is, can we apply toothpaste on burns? Will toothpaste help or worsen the burn? So for burns, you don't, it's not advisable to apply toothpaste. Even if you look at the, if you're familiar with the brand Colgate, they don't. They put it there that it's not advisable to put toothpaste on the wound because the components of the toothpaste you don't know what is what's inside it fully, 
and then also it has um, it can actually sometimes worsen uh, infection can cause infection because it's not a sterile it's not a sterile um, substance so if you apply it it might be cause it may cause more problems okay thank you for that uh, would you recommend petroleum gauze or silver sulfadizing or mebo ointment for treating the burns for, so for those types of burns so those types of um, dressing materials and uh, ointments so we have the it's different stages eh? your wound heals in different stages and it depends on the doctor the preferred um, uh, ointment for example and for acute burns in the initial management the infection can set in within a week so it's advisable if you don't have those um, expensive uh, dressing materials that have a uh, silver laden you can use the silver sulfadiazine dressing daily in order to check the wound and then make sure that that it's being treated um, um, the treatment is done daily so it can help heal the wound faster. So in our training, in our practice here, we use the silver sulfadiazine first. If there's no, um, there's no other provided dressing materials, well, some hospitals don't really have enough dressing materials, just to make sure that infection doesn't set in. For the petroleum gauze or the, the mebo, mebo ointment, we usually apply it on the latter part when the wound is already healing. So it's just like we're just guiding the wound to heal faster by providing moisture. So as I mentioned, moisture will help the wound heal faster. But those mebo and then and then petroleum jelly, actually mebos, they claim that they have antibiotic, antiseptic properties, but it's not really that I'm not proven, I haven't really read much on that regarding its antibiotic properties. Where petroleum jelly and mebo is is actually good products to use when the wound is already healing, not in the, not in the early part of the wound healing. <clears throat> okay, thank you for that. Uh, what do you advise we should carry in a first aid kit for treating burns? So first aid kit for treating burns, definitely you need to have a clean gauze. And then if you have sterile water, for example, irrigating solution, NSS or irrigating water, sterile water, that would be advisable. Clean gloves and then bandage and then soap and water. So any, we have different washes like a chlorhexidine soap. You can, it's just, a, there's a small pack of that. You can put it there so that when you have an injury, you can wash it with that and then wrap it with the sterile uh, dressing afterwards. Okay, thank you. For second degree burns, doc, do you recommend surgery for uh, toddlers or infants like two year olds? So for infants and toddlers, actually they have good healing properties. So sometimes what, what we do is we observe first, as I mentioned, uh, you have a three, you have to observe if the wounds will heal within three weeks, but you don't have to wait for the whole three weeks. It's you have to observe within seven days, you'll have an idea if it will heal or not. Then if it's not healing or improving, then surgery can be done. But if it's, but since um, children have good healing properties, most of the time they can be treated conservatively. But still you have to be wary if you have to, to be more aggressive with the management. Uh, there's a question. If uh, for burns at home, do you recommend putting egg white on first degree burns? No, I haven't read any topic talking about eggs, egg whites. I've heard about, um, I've read about honey. So some use it because it has an antimicrobial properties, but egg white, uh, I'm not sure how sterile that is. So the first, first thing that you have to know is that you have to make sure that the wound is sterile. Because you have a break in the skin, infection sets in because of the break in the skin. So if you apply random stuff on it that are not sterile, then that's where you can have problems. So better to stick with tested materials rather than experiment with household um, materials. Okay, thank you for that, Doc. Uh, how about uh, in line with that, How wh what water should you use to rinse off the burn? Is it uh, 
tap water is okay or you need to use distilled or sterile water? Uh, if you're at home and you don't have any other water supply, then tap water can do, but you just have to soap it properly and wash it. But you have to do it gently, of course, because it's going to be painful. And then if you have access to, to a sterile solution like NSS or, or LR, then you can wash it with that also. So it's, at least it's sterile. <clears throat> uh, another question is, um, uh, what tool should we use uh, to brush off chemical powder from the eyes? For the eyes, I don't, uh, you can apply, you can probably use, if you have a brush there, but soft brush only, but you can't really scrape off the air eye because it might damage the cornea. So for that type, I'd rather you go to the emergency room ASAP and then, and then ask an ophthalmologist what's the best management for that because that's a different um, field of area of burns. Uh, it, there's a question about how to manage uh, post-burn scars. How do you get the color back from being blotchy after a third-degree burn? So one thing you have to know is that once you have a burn scar, once it heals, it will, it will, it won't look the same. It will never be the same color as your original skin, and also the texture will never will actually it won't be the same. You can soften it. There are different scar gels. There are different silicone sheets that you can apply. But don't expect it to be like nothing happened because it's already injured. So over time, it will improve, but it may lighten, but it won't really change. It won't be the same as like nothing happened. Oh, OK. So uh, about the proper dressing for burn wounds, someone is asking if you should cover it, uh, you should cover it with wet gauze or just put antibiotic ointment and cover with any with a dry gauze well if you have an antibiotic ointment then it's moist already then you can apply a dry gauze over it so it also helps prevent um, evaporation of the of the ointment if you cover it so it will stay let the ointment stay especially the oil types, it can evaporate, though you can cover it so it will stay more on the area. But if you don't have that, then you can use a moist gauze that, that can help um, cool down the area. <clears throat> How about aloe vera, Doc? Do you uh, advise putting aloe vera to the burn areas? Again, it, uh, aloe vera can soothe it, but I haven't really read on different burn sources about its um, antiseptic properties. But it can probably help soothe the area. But I don't advise it. Because still, it's, uh, it's from the ground and then it's not a sterile material. So uh, which burn types do you, uh, do you advise that the patient be taken directly to a burn center? Though? So there's a... There's a there's a indication for bringing patients to um, the hospital, especially burn centers. Usually if it's around more than 10% of, um, as mentioned, around deep, deep partial thickness burns, then you have to immediately bring them to the burn center. But if it's just a shallow burn, superficial burns, it, uh, any hospital can do. But if it's like, there's uh, different indications for that. For example, there are burns in the face, or the electrical burns, or or burns in children, or air, and sensitive areas like a hands or groin, or if it's more than fifteen percent the the burn injury, then definitely you have to bring it to the um, accredited burn centers. But for uh, superficial sunburn or small small blistered burns or scalp burns, then you can treat it, uh, get them treated in regular hospitals. Okay, thank you. Uh, for systemic injuries, Doc, um, when shall we expect uh, it after an electrical burn? Do you have any day, how many days we observe the patients after an electrical burn? Immediately you will know it. You, you, will, you have to test it. You have to do diagnostics immediately when you see the patient. So for example, in terms of cardiac, 
once a patient comes to you and then he has um, an electrical burn, then you do the ECGs. You have to check if there's um, irregularities in the rhythm. Also, we have a thing called uh, we test the urine for myoglobinuria. It's when the it's when your muscles are destroyed and then the sediments are brought to the blood vessels. And as we know, everything is expelled out through the urinary feces. So these sediments can actually clog your kidneys, which can cause the destruction of your kidneys. So we, we can test that through different um, diagnostics, ex diagnostic examinations. So however, not all, all hospitals have that. So some government hosp hospitals don't have that. They have to send out the, the, the laboratories, the urinalysis to, to be able to be analyzed. But immediately at the start, you have to do those all those tests and then you can follow it up after two, every one to two days to see if there's any improvement on the, on the findings. Okay. Uh, how about if, uh, uh, if a person got electrocuted and is unconscious, what is, the most, um, what is the most practical first aid management we can do to minimize the injuries for electrical burns? So one thing about electrical burns is that there's a, a low voltage and then there's a high voltage types. So low voltage types, they conduct the current when you touch them. For example, um, in the house sockets or electrical um, equipments in the house. So those are low, low voltage. Difference with the high voltage are those in the electrical towers or the you know, telephone wire, wires or something they have high voltage currents that sometimes you don't even have to touch them and they, they, will, they will already shoot out electrical current. And then that can oftentimes push the patient. They, it can accidentally push the patient and most of them have affiliated falls. For example, where they're on top of the building or where they're working on electrical wires, most of them fall down. So head injury is something that you have to check immediately also. So falls are usually associated with electrical burns. And then most of the time we do a CT scan of the brain also, because sometimes electrical burns have um, injuries, as I mentioned, internally. They can have um, brain injuries aside from the cardiac and then the renal or muscle injuries. Also, of course, you have to do the ABCs, the airway breathing circulation, because you have to make sure the patient's stable first before you do all those procedures, all those diagnostic, diagnostic tests. Okay, thank you for that, Doc. Uh, there is a question here. Uh, is it approved to use tilapia skin in skin grafting here in the Philippines? Is it approved? Yes. It, I've read the studies on that, but you have to think about it. You, have already, you already have provided a lot of dressing materials that are tested. That's still uh, an ongoing study. And then the process for that is very tedious. For example, tilapia fish, for, for those who aren't uh, aware, so tilapia is a fish. So some use it, they take off the skin, and then they sterilize it, and then they pack it, and then they that's what they use to cover the wound. Um, yes, it can work, but I don't see the point because you already have a lot of dressings that are available. So it's going to be an extra effort to find that um, source for tilapia skin and then have it sterilized somewhere, how would you know that sterilization is adequate and then use it? So it, yes, you can, but uh, it's too taxing. Okay, thank you, Doc. So uh, there's a question here. Uh, is soaking the burn area in water advisable? Or just do not, a do not soak, just run it. For example, when you're swimming, what happens to your skin? When you, when you swim too long in the, in the sea or in the uh, pool, your skin gets macerated. So it just worsen the, the injury to the skin because you're softening the skin um, uselessly. So it's better you just apply running water to cool the area for five to 10 minutes. You just need to cool it and then then bring it, cover it, and then bring it, wash it with soap and water, and then bring it to the hospital. 
Okay. How about the blisters, Doc? Is it advisable to pop the blisters or not? Or do you remove the skin? Is, it, is that better? So there are two schools of thought for that. So there are those who believe that you pop the blister. There are those who believe that you unroof the blister. So mo both make sense actually. So you can, so for, if you pop the blister, you have to make sure that you use a sterile uh, needle to pop it because the skin can protect, uh, act like a sterile barrier. So inside it's still sterile. But if you pop it randomly with whatever object, then you're introducing infection into that area. So another another school of thought for that is you unroof the you unroof the blister so that you can adequately clean the area underneath and then you apply and then you apply the dressing material that's available. So that's a, that's advisable. For example, hydrocolloids. There are a lot of foams. There are lots of different dressing materials. Uh, what do you re recommend we should uh, use to cover the burn while we transport the patient? Um, as I've said, uh, clean dressings, if you don't have one, clean, clean um, towels, wash towels, or gauze. If you have sterile gauze at home, if you have a sterile kit at home, and then there, what's important is you apply something clean on it. You can apply uh, ointment piercing ointment or antibiotic ointment on it and then pop it with something clean. Is it recommended to give paracetamols or painkillers before transfer? Yes, you can take um, painkillers. They, they advise non-steroidal painkillers to help with the pain, of course. It's going to be a very painful injury, so there's nothing wrong with drinking pain medications. Okay. Uh, uh, there's a question, Doc. Uh, have you heard of Integra for rebuilding tissue after burns? Yeah, Integra, but however, it's not available in the Philippines. You use it in the States. It's a, it's a biological dressing. So honestly, I don't have experience with it. So I, I'm not in the right position to talk about it. Uh, do you re recommend any ointments or creams for first and second degree burns for it to heal faster or ease the pain? Though? So, so you have the different creams. For example, the silver sulfadiazine. It's a silver, so it's it contains silver that is antiseptic. It can kill the bacteria. Or some some can use the piercing ointment. Either one can actually be used. Uh, you mentioned a greasy gauze. Uh, what is a greasy gauze? Doc? Is it available here in the Philippines? Yes, it's available. So there are sterilized petroleum a gauze with um, soaked in petroleum jelly that is sterile. Of course, you have the petroleum jelly also. You can use that, if, as I mentioned, if it's already towards the heel, lateral, lateral healing part. You can apply gauze and then soak it with petroleum jelly and then wrap it over the wound because it will give the moisture that's needed for the wound to heal, the skin to regenerate. Uh, can we put betadine or hydrogen peroxide to clean the burn area? Um, it can sterilize the area, but if you read about studies, betadine actually and hydrogen peroxide can injure skin because hydrogen peroxide is a, it's a chemical cautery. It, it can help with the bleeding, but it can also burn tissue around it. So it will defeat the purpose of healing. Also the betadine should be, should be um, can also cause delay in tissue healing. But I've seen patients who've healed with betadine, with daily betadine dressing. So it's, it depends on what you have. If you, if you don't have access for better um, antiseptics, then you can do with that. Okay, thank you, Doc. So in minor burns, Doc, uh, how long do you advise to keep the burn being treated with antibiotic and covered with gauze? How long do you eat antibiotic and covered with gauze? Yes, uh, how many days? It depends. As I've mentioned, uh, there are different levels of or severity of burns. So some burns won't heal after even after three, three weeks. So it's better to have it checked by uh, rather than treat it at home and just think that it's nothing. It's better to have it checked by a doctor if you have access to um, the hospital. 
because some some burns they will heal definitely but some as i've shown in the pictures before they can have contractures they can have scars that are thickened that will affect functioning of that burn area especially in the hands in the mouth area in the eyelid area so it's it's it depends on how it's assessed uh, and another uh, related question, Doc, if, if the gauze that we cover the burn with uh, stick to the skin, how do, you ma uh, how, how do we manage it? So moisten the gauze. That's why I've said you use moist gauze, moist towel or petroleum jelly or apply an ointment first so that you make the area moist. So key turned out there is moisture so that it doesn't stick. For example, mebo, it's, uh, you can apply it with gauze and then wrap it. And then you have to apply it frequently around twice or thrice a day so it doesn't dry out. So you have to keep it moist. If There's not, if it's, if it's stuck, then just apply water and then pull it gently to be able to take it out. Okay, thank you for that. Though. So uh, there's a question here from, uh, I think it's a uh, uh, in hospital settings, most of the patients have uh, potassium drip or sodium bicarbonate uh, or drug burns. Uh, what is the first aid for that? For extravasation? If you're talking about extravasation injuries for burns, uh, there, there are treatment options like you can do steroid injections in that area. But of course, if it's still, uh, if it's definitely, if it's going to be a deep burn because it's underneath the skin, then you treat it as a, a second degree burn, like a normal burn. And then if you have to take out that dead tissue, then you do the surgery. Then you have to undergo surgery for that patient. But some, some, some conservative treatment, they apply steroid, they inject steroids on that burn area and then, and then apply moisture and, and silver sulfidizing to prevent infection and then observe if it's going to improve or not. Uh, someone is asking if uh, microbial cellulose is being used as dressing in the Philippines? Mm, in our institution, no, we don't use it, so I'm not really familiar with that one. Maybe in, in other first world countries like the US, maybe they have that, but here it's not really, we're not really familiar with that. In, in the Philippines, Doc, do we have any skin banks? No, there's no skin bank here in the Philippines. So we really have to take skin from the patient. There's Sometimes they, they have those cultured skin, but it's not available here yet. Where they culture the skin, but it will take some time, and then you use that skin. Oh, okay. Uh, so... One more last question, Doc. Uh, do you always give tetanus shots to burn injuries? Yeah, actually, in the in the guidelines, you advise it's advisable that you do tetanus shot tetanus shots for burn patients. Okay, I think that's it, Doc. That was the last question. Uh, so, uh, everyone, I would like to remind to like and subscribe the Facebook and YouTube uh, page of St. Luke's, and you can see the videos there uploaded. Okay, so that's it. I hope we've answered everything. There's no certificate for this. It's just a free lay forum. So this is not any official certificate forum that you're attending i hope you i hope a lot of you learn from it so i hope that everything as i made it as practical as possible so that you can use it at home and that's a main purpose of this lay forum okay keep safe everyone